on. Go. Welcome to Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. I am your host, Joy Vatrabeck. This is my co-host, Mark Renahan. How are you doing, everybody? Mark, I'm really excited about our uh, background. I here love the, the new flag. background. It's perfect for Very our Remembering 9-11 nice. series this it is. week. It is. I wore my fish shirt today Very nice. with the American Very flag nice. on it. I wore a different one on Monday, just for the record. Thank you all for joining us for the third in our series of Remembering 9-11, 20 years later. Absolutely. And if you missed the first two, please go on to our website at www.ascf.us. You can also... Uh, Yes, live streaming today on our Facebook page, Protecting Our Freedoms. But the first two podcasts were excellent with Sergeant, uh, for our retired New York PD, PD Sergeant Jerry Kane. Jerry Kane, and yesterday was John Renahan, who was in the towers across, or the, the offices across, offices from, the across towers. from the towers. Also, a very interesting story. So, we thank you very much for your following. And Mark, would you like to introduce? Uh, yeah. Today's so guest? today we have a, another perspective on September 11th. Uh, of course, on the first day we had retired retired Sergeant Jerry Kane. Jerry was outside when the buildings fell, was covered in dust, and had you know incredible story behind what happened afterwards in the following days. Then we had John Renahan, who was an attorney for the city of New York. John was a little late for work that day, which was, you know, some may say a good thing, but he joined the Citizens Brigade. Afterwards, he joined the Army, and we heard his story there. But today, we have somebody who is actually in one of the towers. Today, I have uh, my friend and my former college football teammate, Sean Pierce. Sean was on the 70, did we say the 73rd 73rd floor? floor? of the tower. Sean, how are you doing, buddy? Welcome. Good, how are you? I'm great. So, Sean, I, I want to get right into it. And what we were doing on the other episodes is we were asking our guests if they could just kind of walk us through their day on September 11th. And, I, you know, I know that obviously this is not um, the great, it was probably one of the worst days, if not the worst day of your life. And I, it's not something you would probably love to go through. And I appreciate you being here. So uh, let's just take it away. So you're working at Morgan Stanley. You're a young guy living in New York City. Uh, what was it like? And, you know, how, how, how would, before all this happened, Sean, how did you like working in the World Trade Towers? Um, I loved it. It was really my pride and joy. Um, you know, as you know, Mark, I'm a kid from a small town, Cape Cod, you know, Falmouth, Mass. Uh, the biggest building that I saw on a regular basis was Falmouth Hospital, which was like two stories. Uh, so literally every single night before I went to bed, I'd look out the window and look at the trade center from my apartment in Jersey city. And I just couldn't believe that I, that I worked there. Um, so, um, yeah, I loved working there. You know, we had, uh, it was, you know, I was 28 years old, you know, young kid, uh, you know, having, having a time of my life, you know, partying it up all over the city, working hard, playing hard. Um, you know, we used to go up to the windows of the world on the 110th story, um, about, you know, once, once a week or something like that, have a couple drinks. Uh, it was fun. All right. So it's September 11th and you're on, you're in work and you're up on the, you said the 73rd floor working for Morgan Stanley. Yes. All right. So you're in the 73rd floor and then you hear a boom and go from there. So a guy by the name of Tom McCarville. Uh, yells, bomb, bomb, bomb. Get the fuck out. Get the fuck hey, out. Hey, Sean, try the language, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I um, so, uh, you know, we, as a group, uh, you know, ran towards the stairwell. I don't know why nobody went to the elevator. We just went to the stairwell for whatever reason. Um, I saw one of the secretaries. The secretaries in there, we were very, very close to. Um, a lot of them, we'd go out, you know, they'd go come out with us for a drink or whatever after work, really, really fun group, really, really tight knit. Even back before September 11th, um, we were all, you know, we were all friends. Anyway, there was a girl named Kristen Farrell and she just looked like it looked like a deer in the headlights. So, you know, I ran over and I was like, Kristen, we have to get out of here. And she just kind of looked at me. I said, come on, let's go. So I grabbed her, well, not grabbed her, but kind of pulled her, you know, towards the, the door. Now, there was about three or four of us. This is a story behind the story. There was about three or four of us that were in the building one night, maybe, I don't know, four or five months before. And if you would come off that elevator in a million years, if I gave you, you know, a million dollars, you would have never found that door. It was behind a really, really uh, 
um, polished up um, trap door. It was a, like a really um, highly polished piece of wood with the Morgan Stanley insignia on it. If you ran into the wall hard enough though, it swung open and there was the stairwell, but it was hidden. And for years I worked there, I never knew that existed. One night we were there and there was actually a, um, a fire on the train and there was smoke coming up through the, um, the elevators. So we had to take the stairs down. So the security called us and you know, told us this is what's going on. It was eight o'clock at night, we were still working. You know, and just said, hey, guys, not, you know, don't don't worry, but this is what's going on, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I truly believe if us four were not in that building, I don't think anybody would have ever found that staircase. Um, so anyway, we kind of, you know, put a shoulder into it and busted it open. And then from that point forward, you know, we were walking down the stairs and it wasn't what you thought at all. It wasn't pandemonium. Nobody was screaming. I remember, you know, seeing guys with the Wall Street Journal tucked under their arm and they were just like, same stuff, different day, right? They'd been through this before, no big deal, right? Um, Sean, did you, what, what, what did you personally think it was when, when it first happened, you heard the noise and you guys were going down the stairs? Did you, did you know it was a plane at first or were you just like, there's something going on, we got to get out? No, I knew right away. Um, they told us it was a small biplane that it had hit the building. Um, I didn't buy that for a minute. Um, you know, that day was, it was the perfect day. You know, there was no humidity, not a cloud in the sky. Um, there's no way that, you know, whether you were flying a, you know, a Cessna or a 747 that you would accidentally hit one of the biggest buildings in the world. Um, so I, I knew it was terrorism. And I, and I treated it like that. And I was aggressively running down the stairs, you know, um, now you're with because the, I knew I, you're with the four people that you were talking about earlier. You'd knock that, you know, so you're down and you're in the stairwell now going down the stairs. Well, there's, there's hundreds of us. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I got you. Yeah. But yeah. So Sean, I'm with basically, can I ask something real quick? So were you guys, it didn't sound like you were ever given any security protocol as to if there was an emergency to go down the stairwell, or were some people given that? No, no. Uh, security was nowhere to be found. Um, we were actually told um, on the way down, probably about stair, I don't know, 35, 36, they told us, hey, listen, go back to work. This was just an accident. It was a small biplane. Um, go back to the office, and I, I, I didn't buy it. I just said no. I, I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm getting out of here. Wow. Uh, and now, so now you're on what floor when the when the plane hits your tower? So about the thirty third, and um, it really rocked the building hard. You know, it really, really did. Um, my building. If you were in this on the 73rd floor, it swayed anywhere. Um, and you'd never know it uh, because during the day there was all sorts of you know loud noises and people on the phone and blah blah. But if you were there on, on the weekend or if you went to the bathroom late at night, like eight o'clock at night, and a lot of times we were there that that late, you would hear the building swaying a little bit. Um, and it would they said on a normal day it would sway, I don't know, 15 feet either way uh, but like I said under normal circumstances you, you would have no idea but you could hear it in the bathroom if there was no other noise okay um but anyway that day the building when it got hit I mean it knocked me off my feet Sean what I forget um, this already but what floor did the second plane hit do you remember I don't remember. uh so it was about um 74 Five maybe to ninety six. It came in sideways, if you remember. I, I do. So you you were you would have been on the seventy third floor, correct? If you had not gone down the stairs. Yes, yes, right. and it wouldn't have hit my floor. But I know guys that were up there when it happened, and immediately there was gasoline all over the floor, mm. and it was you know it, it from what I heard it had uh, all the rooms, all the 
like the mail room, all, all the, you know, the studs, everything was just, was just incinerated in like two seconds. Wow. And everything was on fire in two seconds. Um, those guys, there was two guys that ran up to try to get one of the guys out. And those two made it, the other one didn't. Um, all right, so, so anyway, you're on the 33rd floor. It strikes the 73rd floor, and it literally... Not, and, and for those who don't know, Sean's a big guy. He's probably, what are you, about 6'3", PSC, 6'4"? Yeah. And you weigh, I don't know what you weigh now. We're a little older. I'm not going to tell you my weight, Sean. But uh, yeah, I yeah. know back in the day, you were about 230 when we played. So Sean's a big defensive lineman. So to get him to get knocked over, it's obviously a, a massive really? blast. So go from there, Sean. I'm oh, sorry to keep interrupting you. Yeah, so it, it, it literally, like, the, the building swayed left, and it went way left. And then it went way right, and then it went way left again, and then way right. We we thought the building was going to snap in half, which was the intentions. Um. So um. You know, at that point in time, you know, I, uh, you just kind of rely on what you have. I mean, I, I I grew up Catholic and made the sign of the cross and said, God, is this really how I'm, how it's going to end. Is this how I'm going to die? You know, and you know, they say there's no, you know, atheist in a foxhole. And, um, you know, I, I didn't think I was getting out. Um, you know, I did have a, you know, pretty strong belief in God and everything, but, um, you know, that day I didn't think I was getting out. So from that point forward, I was counting the floors, you know, um, 33, 32. Sean, when you're going down the stairs, right? Um, yep. Are the stairs packed full of people at this point? Are you, are you guys all in a line going down? Uh, or is it just like, I mean, is it, is it chaos? I hate to, you know, I, this is a tough subject to bring up, I know. but It's it, not chaotic. That's no. the thing. You would think it would be. It's still pretty calm. All right. Now, is, are the stairwells full? Yes. All right. So everyone's just walking down in single file. So at this point... Every you say, and everyone's calm and, and everything in in your head, you're just counting the floors as you go down. Yeah, and as I'm going down, there's firefighters coming up, <sighs> and I knew they weren't making it out. And you know, the the firefighters had a a, um, a station right across the street, and uh, every day we would say, "Hey, four o'clock slice." So we'd go uh, outside the trade center. It's not like working in a regular building. You can't just walk outside and grab a smoke or whatever. Um, you know, not that I smoke, but, um, you know, we'd, we would take a walk every every uh, day at four o'clock, you know, when the market closed, grab a slice of pizza, you know, maybe get, you know, a slushy or whatever, which was right, right across the street. And the firefighters were right there, right next to the place we got the pizza. So we'd shoot the breeze with these guys. You know, I'm not going to say I knew them by name, but like I knew them. So, um, yeah, those guys are etched in my brain <clears throat> um, forever. You know, and I, and I appreciate every firefighter and every cop that I will to this day. Not that I didn't before, but I still have that extra special, you know, feeling towards, towards them. Um, so yeah, so we, we just kept, uh, walking, um, you know, 70, you know, 33rd, 30, 32, 31. Finally, I remember when we got down to about the 11th story, I started to see daylight and I started thinking I might get out of here, you know? So I keep counting, still not thinking that I'm going to get out, but thinking I've got a chance. I've got a chance that I might live. So we got down, um, finally got down to the bottom and we couldn't go out the front door. We were told that, um, we were told that there were pieces of the building falling off um, and the white stuff was all outside and stuff like that. So we couldn't go out the front door. Um, I'm not sure if you were ever, ever there or not, but there's a mall. There was a mall underneath the trade center. Um, and so we went through the mall and came out um, by the Millennium Hotel. Yeah, I'm sure if you know know what that is, but um, that that's the one that got completely burned. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was sort of across the street. 
so uh yeah then from that point on you know we we um it's a really long story from this point on but we we basically walked um to the south street seaport you know kind of gathered my thoughts i left my wallet up there money cell phone everything was was in my desk because we were told we were going back to work and we had no idea what was about to happen so you know anyway we ended up going um sort of uptown and uh, this is a one funny story from the day. Um, we ended up stopping in Chinatown. And even though that, you know, I was 28 in, in decent shape, you're still not like prepared to, to run 73 stairs, you know, and then all across town. And then, you know, there was stairs even in the, in the mall that you, we had to walk. So it's pretty tired. It's thirsty. You know, it's not like you can just pop in a store and, you know, grab a, a Coke or whatever. So we're running, we're kind of walking through Chinatown and um, some lady says, hey, why don't you come here? I got waters for you. I was like, oh my God, thank you. Now, in my mind at this point, you know, we were hearing crazy things in the streets and, you know, I heard they bombed Brooklyn and I'm like, Brooklyn, like, why would they bomb Brooklyn? Like, that's all residential, you know? So in my mind, we're getting attacked, you know, and in my mind, Every single town in the United States is just getting carpet bombed. Uh, and that's, that's what was going through my head. And it's not like today. Like, you have to understand, like, there weren't cell phones everywhere. Um, there weren't flat screen TVs everywhere you turned around. So, you know, we run through the was, streets. was tough. Say it again? Information was tough to get. It wasn't like today where, I mean, and, I, and yeah. God, God knows that when the that happened, I'm, I'm assuming what, you know, I know we had cell phones then, but I think in 2001, I, I'd only had a cell phone. Maybe they came out in like, I think 97, I got my first one or yeah, something like that. Yeah. If you had one, it was probably like a Blackberry or something. Yeah. I mean, and I, 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 I like to tell the younger yeah. guys that back in the day of the, the original cell phones, you got to remember, we couldn't use them between the hours of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. or it cost like, you know, some a like, billion dollars. Yeah, a minute. Yeah. So you'd only use them after nine and on the weekends is when you would use them. So... So, Sean, where were you when, like, I, I keep hating to bring up these subjects, but when the first tower actually collapsed, are you in Chinatown now? Yes, I was in Chinatown. And um, <clears throat> like I said, this lady was gracious enough to come out with a couple bottles of water, which was amazing. Um, <laughs> then we went into a barber shop. I can't even remember why we went in there. But there's a Chinese guy getting a haircut. And I'm yelling at the guy. I'm like, dude, the world is ending. And he's like, <laughs> looking just fresh to death, you know? <laughs> I was dying laughing. I'm like, I literally thought the world was going to end. And this guy just wants to go out looking like. If the know, world's going to end, you want a nice fade, Piercy. You know what oh, I mean? You want to look good. I was, I, I, that was my one funny story of the day. So um, anyway, yeah, we went out. And then um, the did, biggest did you... sound I ever heard in my life. Uh, the only way I can describe it was it sounded like a tidal wave of sound coming at me. And I looked behind me and the, and the trade center was coming down. I could not believe it. That, that was, was not that my was building. your tower at the top, that one? I'm, I'm sorry? That was your tower? Well, that was the no, first, that was the actually tower. one. The the first first tower. That was okay. one. I was in two. Um, so if you remember, one came down mm-hmm. first. Uh, two came down second. Two was the one with the steeple on it. Okay. Or antenna, whatever you want to call it. You know, it, um, that was my building. Mm. And that came down, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes later. Okay. Sean, when the first one came down, and by the way, you know, we, we had Sergeant Kane on from the uh, NYPD, and, and he said the exact same thing that you said. He said, you've never heard a noise so loud in your life. Um, it's It's crazy that... You know, we, we've got you and we had John and we had Sergeant Kane on and your stories are kind of all intersecting yeah, with, you know, like everybody has been saying, and even when I'm watching documentaries on TV this week, everyone's saying the same thing. What a beautiful day, September 11th. It, was, it wasn't a cloud in the sky. But it, back to the noise, Sergeant Kane also said that at first it was the loudest thing and then he said it was eerily quiet afterwards. Do you remember that? Um, I, I don't remember too much after that. Okay, I mean, sure. that... Um, that crushed me, you know. Um, like I said, I was proud to work there. It wasn't just a building to me, um, you know. So it, 
after that, we ended up going up to um, an area called Stytown. Town. Um, the girl that I helped out, um, her cousin lived there. And, um, you know, we got pizza or whatever. I couldn't get off the island that night. Uh, the buses were shut down. The, the, the train that I, that I, you know, would um, come in on every day, the tunnel was blown up with water in it. So I, I couldn't go back that way. The uh, boats were all shut down. Um, so I couldn't take a boat out. So literally I had, I had to stay there and sleep on a couch for the night. Um, you know, I wasn't able to um, get through to my parents. So my parents saw this horrific thing on TV and had no idea if their son was alive or dead. And so, um, you know, I just kept hitting redial, 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 and nothing. So I finally called a friend of mine in the Bronx, another guy that I went to school with, and I just said, hey, Frank, I can't get a, a number out of Manhattan. I said, if I give you my number, you know, can you call my parents and just let them know that I'm alive and tell them I'll call them as soon as I can. So um, he finally got through. So I don't know how long it was. It was probably, you know, three, four hours, five hours. And they finally heard that I was alive. And then um, I literally just sat there just hitting dial, you know, redial all day. And I finally got through to them around 11 o'clock at night. And they finally talked to me. And relief, um, as, as I can't even imagine. Yeah, it was tough. And then, um, you know, I just watched the uh, Stag Town was overlooking uh, the Hudson River. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> and we saw, um, you know, Coast Guard boats going up and down the Hudson River. Um, not an M16 on the front, but M60s which I just couldn't, I couldn't believe I was seeing M60s. Um, I didn't sleep that night at all. I just kind of stared out the window and tried to make sense of it all. In the morning, um, I tried to get back to, um, to my apartment in Jersey City. So I was in New Jersey, which was right across the Hudson River. I mean, I, I got to work from the second I woke up to the second I you know, walked in the door. It was only 20 minutes. It was a great commute. Um, a lot of my friends lived up the west side, up the east side, and you know, it would take them an hour and a half, two hours to get to work. It took me 20 minutes. So anyway, that day I ended up um, jumping on a bus and I told the guy, I said, listen, I don't have a dollar to my name. I said, all my money you know, is in the bank. I don't have a wallet anymore. I, I don't have he, I got nothing. I said, all I can show you is my business card. And this is where I was yesterday. So he says, holy crap. Are you serious? I said, yeah. He said, get on the bus. I'll take you home. I said, all right. Um, there happened to be a um, New York Times reporter on, on the, the bus. It was just her and I and, and this bus driver. And I guess he took me home. I don't even remember how I got home. I, I, I can't remember that, but he must have taken me home. Um, the New York Times reporter um, interviewed me, or, or I think she said, you know, let me take your number and I'll interview you. And, you know, the next day I was in the New York Times, like, you know, just very surreal. Um, years later, they took some of those excerpts. And I was actually in a book called, um, I think it was called uh, 22 Minutes or something like that. Um, and it, it, oddly enough, that was the only time that I kind of got really upset over the World Trade Center was reading my exact, not, not a paraphrase and not the story that I've told a million times, but my exact words from when I was 28 years old. Um, and that, that kind of really upset me. But other than, other than that, I've told the story so many times, I've kind of you know, I, I can do it and not lose it. Okay. No, go ahead. When, when did you realize, or did you hear uh, that two other planes had, one went down in Pennsylvania, obviously, in the Pentagon as well? When did you hear those? So I didn't know any of that until later on. Um, like I said, we were hearing crazy things in the streets. Uh, people were telling us that, you know, they were bombing all sorts of places. 
And, you know, we didn't know there were planes, you know, I didn't know if it was a plane or a bomb. I, you know, I wasn't sure. Nobody really knew. It was just mass confusion at that point. No, it's, it's you know, I, I remember when the, the Boston Marathon bombings happened, which I know were not you know, even close in the size of the devastation, but the stories that were roaming around, you know, I lived in the city at the time and everybody was saying it was this, it was that, you know, there's another bomb here. So I can only imagine what you were hearing down there. Um, Sean, I, I, when did you, I mean, I, I hate to even bring this up, but did, did you lose a lot of coworkers at Morgan Stanley or? or? Um, no, actually. Oh. Um, so that was our world headquarters. Okay. Um, we had 45 stories. Wow. Um, on my floor alone, we probably had, um, I don't know, 200 brokers. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we had, you know, brokers, you know, we had, you know, VPs, we had, um, you know, the mail room. I mean, it, it was a lot of people on that floor and every floor was like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it could have been a lot worse. Um, it, it really could have, I, I think we got lucky and, um, we lost about 11 people, I believe. And, and I don't want to, you know, make that like it's a small thing. It's right. every, every life is important, but I just think it could have been a lot worse. Uh, that's, that's, you know, so now, Sean, after, you know, it happened, you're back at your house and, you know, it's the next day or whatever. When, when did you, or, or, what happened with work? Like, what did you guys do? When did you go back to work? How, how did all that pan out? So that was a nightmare. They, um, they wanted me to go to work. And, and, and oddly enough, the girl that I dated through college, her dad was in the World Trade Center the first time. So it's like, that was one of my questions, believe it or not, on the interview was, hey, wasn't this the building? And again, I'm not a New Yorker, right? I'm a kid from a small town on a Cape, you know what I mean? And, you know, I'm thinking like, hey, wasn't this the building that, that got hit? So I, as you remember, in like 91, there was the truck that, you know, ran into the garage yep. right. and blew up. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, what's to say that's not going to happen again? This is literally a conversation that I had on my interview. And what? they said, well, it can't happen again. I said, why? And they said, well, we have security now. I go, oh, okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Not knowing that this would ever, 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 ever take place. Um, so uh, when you say on your interview, I'm sorry, I just caught that. So when Morgan yeah. Stanley was interviewing you for your job, you said, you know, there was an attack here once. What are you guys planning? I, I didn't get that. So all right, I just caught that. So that's actually probably not a question that most people will ask when they're on a job interview is, uh, you know, is there going to be a terrorist attack here and how do we stop it? So that's kind of a. Uh, I guess a dark omen. So, Piercy really first. Strange. Yeah. So, so uh, go ahead. After that, let me let me just uh, get this thought out before I forget it. Um, this is sort of ancient history, but um, after that, we didn't work for I don't know, maybe a month, three weeks, a month. We had nowhere to go, and they were trying to figure out where we were going to get relocated. I mean, we had forty-five stories. So they had to like chop everybody up and send people to different places. And um, so they wanted me to go to two Penn Plaza. So two Penn Plaza is Madison square garden. So I'm thinking like, okay, so I just got blown up <laughs> and now that I'm in like the number one, if not, let's say number two or three target, right. With the trade center. And now they want me to go to another basically target and i you know i said i'll keep an open mind it's a 22nd floor and you know i went up to the 22nd floor and i just burst out into sweat and i said can't do this man he said what i said i can't work in a big building i can't work on this floor and he said well what do you want to do and i said listen i i'm from cape cod and I said, I think I remember there being a uh, Morgan Stanley down there. I said, can you transfer me down there? I said, sure. So I said, all right. So uh, he said, hey, if that's good for you, it's good for us. So I said, all right. So anyway, I made arrangements. And uh, first, this is my second sort of funny story. Um, 
so I, I move all my stuff because I had, I still had a, a, some stuff that I had at my apartment that wasn't in the office. I shouldn't probably be saying that, but I did. Just leads and stuff like that. Um, that, you know, that I'd cycle back and forth into the office uh, just because I had too much of it. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I get my stuff and I go down to the office in Hyannis. I get all my, you know, my cubicle or whatever is all set up. Wouldn't you know, there's a fire alarm the very first day. So I get there around seven o'clock in the morning. The alarm goes off and it's loud at around eight o'clock. I hadn't even met one person yet. I talked to the manager on the phone yet. He wasn't even in yet. You could imagine the response I had. Mm. I was sprinting down the feet, down the, the, the hallway like I was sprinting down a football field screaming like a maniac and then realized oh <laughs> it's a fire alarm it in high just end. a fire alarm it's no big deal and everybody was looking at me like i had 12 heads and i said i can explain i promise and i had to tell everyone the story it's, it's probably funny now but i mean at the time obviously you were experiencing the ptsd from yes. when it just happened yeah, Sean, have you, do you still have an issue? Um, Joey's going to ask yeah. you a question in a second, but do you, do you still have an issue going into tall buildings today? Or? A question. I'm going to have to ask. I mean, I can do it. I prefer not to. Uh, there was a time when I was in pharmaceuticals where I had to stay in tall buildings all the time. I didn't like it, and I never really, uh, I never really slept all that well. Um, I think, uh, you know, during, the, during those times, I would just have a, We'll call it a couple drinks to <laughs> to go to sleep, um, but I definitely didn't like it. Yeah. Now, Sean. So, a couple of quick things before we get to Joy's next question, and, it, and it, it's, it's in regards to um, just terrorism in general. I know we were discussing it earlier, but I want to say just to kind of break it up with a little bit of uh, whatever humor. You've done quite well so far. The boys all bet that you would swear within a minute, and you did. I appreciate that part. Um, so you, you, you yeah, I want to bet that Zank said, "Oh, there's no way he will, he won't be able to not swear in the first minute." I said, "Even if I tell him," and they said, "Oh no," they all said, "No, no, he'll swear in the first minute." So you did. I appreciate that. But again, it's part of a uh, emotional story. So I think our viewers who are all adults are, are okay with with that. So I wanted to get that off. But I would like to say that in the next question, we we are not going to swear, brother. So let's <laughs> keep that in mind. But Joy Joy's husband is a Marine. Um, who also, um, I think he was in Iraq. He was uh, in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah. So, but she just had a question she wanted to ask. I wanted to just, you know, prep you for it, but go ahead. Well, feelings, he has feelings right now toward um, the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan and the Taliban taking back over. So I'm just wondering how you what your feelings are on that. I'm hoping I'm feeling the same thing that every American's feeling, which is anger. I mean, to see all the work that we've done over there for so many right. years, just to go backwards is, is frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, that's how he feels, very frustrated. Now, Sean. You're getting the cleaned up version, but. Yeah, no, I. I, I <laughs> Thank I, you. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that, brother. Um, again, one of the, the amazing things, you know, when, when we've been talking to different people for the last three days, and we also watched this amazing documentary, mm -hmm. and, and Sean, I'm going to send you a copy of this. It's called uh, Looking for My Brother. It's Tomorrow's Guest. But he told the story of his brother who went up after the attacks. He was part of a uh, Massachusetts urban search and rescue team from FEMA. And basically his story through that. But it's, it's amazing to me talking to you, Sergeant Kane, my cousin Jono. Like all of your stories are kind of almost interlapping. Yeah. Like um, we saw in the documentary that um, John Kenny, who's Tomorrow's Guest, helped build these wooden um, stretchers. And my cousin John actually did it too. So we don't even know if they might've been in the same group. Uh, you know, like uh, we've heard from a couple of different people who have seen the one of the engines in front of the hotel uh, yeah. on it. And it's just, uh, you know, it's a- Both it's, of them said that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible day in the history of our nation. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we mentioned yesterday is, the, not that there was any bright lights from it, but after the attacks, was I, I can still say this that it's the last time I can recall, or maybe after the marathon bombings also, where the whole country was united in one, yep. you know, happy, you know, patriotic, happy display or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. I keep pointing yeah, out flags that, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. I mean, everyone was buying 
Flag, I mean, if you, you sold some flag bumper stickers, you made cash right away uh, after September 11th. But it was just a, you know, it was a time when we came together as a nation. And so that was good. Now, Sean, I know you're a busy guy and we're getting close to the end here. But I forgot to ask my cousin yesterday, but I heard you say that you used to go outside and talk to the firefighters. And, and again, the most powerful part of the story, in my opinion, is you going down the stairs while the firefighters mm. are going up. And, you're, you know, you're knowing in your head that these guys aren't coming back. But... Uh, I asked Sergeant Kane his opinion, but do you, and I know you're a Cape Codder, but do you recall your favorite pizza when you lived in New York? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, typically I like round pizza. Okay. Well, I don't mean... I like all yeah, pizza. I never yeah, met a pizza. I mean, yeah, from, from where? where? From where, Piercy? From where? <laughs> as, as the boys are laughing when they heard that. But where, where? Do you remember where you'd get it from? No, I mean, I, I, there was two two places we used to get it from that was right across from the Trade Center. I, I couldn't tell you the names. All right. I, they, they don't even exist anymore. I'll let, oh, you, wow. I'll let you off the hook on that one. <laughs> Sean, also, is it true that you were a member of the 1991 undefe undefeated Dean Junior College Red Demon football team? Is that true? Sure was, and yeah. All right, I'm just wow. making sure. I, I had to do that so the boys got that one. Go there. Demons! There you go, there you go. But listen, brother, I really appreciate you coming on. I know that this is not a topic... Um, that anyone would like to talk about, and I'm sure it brings up. So just one, you know, one last kind of question that Joy and I have been asking everybody is, um, like, what does this 20-year anniversary mean to you? Like, what would, you know, when, when it comes to September 11th, are you, you know, you definitely will never forget, you know, and you want people to remember what happened. I mean, how does this week, what emotions go through your, your head this week? Yeah, so that's a question I get asked a lot is, you know, how do you feel on September 11th? And, you know, does it affect you, you know, any more than, you know, any other day? And the answer is no. Um, it's something that will always be with me every single day of the year. You know, it never goes away. It's like a weight that's always on your shoulders. Um, it, it's something you think about, you know, a lot. Uh, and it's, it's dulled. It really has dulled. Um, you know, I forget a lot of the things now and, you know, but, um, you know, for a long time, I was no different than, you know, one of the, you know, probably your colleagues, you know, husband that, you know, went off to Afghanistan and a big sound and I would jump and, you know, if a plane went over every night, my muscles would get so tense that it felt like they were going to rip off the bone. Um, and that's sleeping. That's during my sleep. And I'd wake up and I was sore like I had worked out. So, you know, I, I can relate to a lot of those guys that went off to war and, and, and came back. Um, and I, you know, I've got friends that are in the military that um, will talk to me and, um, you know, we can, I can relate to them. Let's, let's put it that way. I can relate to them. So, you know, getting back to your question, it's, you know, I, you know, do I think about it a little bit more? Sure. You know, I'm, I'm just glad that it's not all over the TV in, in one sense, because it was really tough to watch. Uh, you know, in the beginning, I would just turn the TV off and walk out of the room. Um, you know, for the 20th anniversary, I mean, the things that, that, that I think about, you know, when I think about it, I try not to think about hardships but like the relationships that I have you know from that day um, and they've become you know they're so strong these people um, you know are, are unbelievable friends of mine um, to the point where you know about uh, I don't know a couple of years ago I called one of them and said hey listen my kids want to see the Statue of Liberty I'm coming to New York I'd love to see you guys I said I know it's short notice it's a Wednesday you know, I'll be there on Friday. And they said, no way. And they ended up uh, picking me up. And, you know, we got everybody together. We had all these, you know, all the boys together. We, all their wives came, kids. You know, we had a, you know, went to a restaurant. You know, my wife got to meet, you know, all these guys that I talked about for years and um, their wives and their kids. And it was, it was amazing. And, you know, that's, um, those are the things that I try to focus on. Um, versus the pain, you know, because the pain is always going to be there. And like I said, it dulls a little bit, but it's always there. Yeah, no, I mean, Sergeant Kane was telling us the same mm -hmm. thing. He still mm -hmm. speaks with the people that he went through it with. And, you know, you guys must have a, a ridiculously special bond for that. So, um, Sean, that's, it's an incredible story. And it's, it's one that 
You know, I don't know if you know, but a lot of our guys don't know this. You know that, right? Like, uh, I, I was talking to a lot of the boys and told them you were coming on, and, and several of them had no idea that you were in one of the towers on September 11th. I know that I'm one of the few you told years ago, so, uh, but it's an incredible story. We're glad you're still here. Yes. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, we're coming to our end. Julie, you want to? Yeah, it's an honor to have you on, Sean. Thank you for sharing your story. I know it's a difficult time, and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Thank your husband for his service. Thank you. And, you know, I, I really believe that uh, the wives and the families are just as much responsible and, you know, a part of that is as the husband because you guys have to hold everything down when they're gone. So I thank you as well. Thank you. All right. Well, any other thoughts? No, I think that's coming to an end. So, Joe, you want to kind of finish it up, take this out? Yes. Well, thank you to our listeners. And all of our podcasts can be found on our website at www.ascf.us. Uh, we also are live streaming on Facebook on our Protecting Our Freedoms page. Mark, and, what's our other social media? Uh, we're also on YouTube, Instagram, all of the social media, but mainly Rumble. We, Rumble, yes, yeah, we all are. the social yes, media. You can find us. Just go to our. Facebook, we're going to go live from here. It's called Protecting Our Freedoms. But then we'll upload it all to um, all your favorite podcast formats. And you can, you know, go to Apple Podcasts and all that. So today we had on with us Sean Pierce. Again, he was part three. He was on the 73rd floor when he was working for Morgan Stanley when the planes hit. Um, the day before that, we had my cousin John, who was an attorney for the city of New York, who was running late for work when the planes hit and actually used his Renahan charm and fake police badge <laughs> that they gave him at the city office to get down to ground zero and uh, do some work with a volunteer unit. And of course, uh, the, we started off with retired New York Police Detective Sergeant Jerry Kane, who Jerry was working when it happened for the police commissioner's office, and his story is incredible also. But tomorrow, Sean, you really should tune in, as should all of um, the Boston folks who are, are here. I, I know that we've had a uh, heavily Irish Catholic presence this week on the, on the show, but I, I had to get these guests kind of fast. But tomorrow we have on a, a man named John Kenny. Um, John has a documentary right here called Looking for My Brother. Again, John's brother, Tom Kenny. Uh, and by the way, uh, Sean, just to, to say what a small world it is, Sean, uh, John's brother, Tom Kenny, was working for the Hyannis, I believe, fire department mm -hmm. and also was on a FEMA search and rescue team yes. when he got called down. This documentary here, Looking for My Brother, is a must-watch, excellent. excellent documentary um, going into, you know, after the aftermath down there. But, Sean, oh, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing this. I know it's, uh, a, you know, an incredibly, you know, just rough story to get out, but uh, I appreciate you coming on for me. And I will uh, talk to you offline afterwards. Everybody who tuned in today, thank you so much. Never forget September 11th, 20 years later. We appreciate it. Tomorrow will be part four. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Julie.